Good morning, everyone. It's a joy to see you today and to worship with you. My voice is a notch or so lower today, uh, fighting off a, a bug of some kind, and I hope I do not share that with any of you today. And also just want to let you know that uh, Danielle and I will be away Wednesday and Thursday of this week. Uh, as you know, we're part of the Baptist the International Baptist uh, Convention, and so once a year they have a, sort of an introductory retreat for pastors who are new in the past year. Uh, Jimmy Martin, who many of you know, of course, will be leading that, and so that'll be up near Frankfurt, and I think there's about four new pastors this year. There's about 60-some churches, as I recall, in the uh, IBC. So anyway, if there's some kind of emergency that comes up Wednesday or Thursday, please call uh, one of the uh, elders, Olin, or I think John will be back by then, or Andre, and um, we'll just be gone for those two days. So, well, uh, please join me in a word of prayer. Dear God, we have gathered to worship you and praise you this day because you truly are great in all of your ways, as we have just sung And you are always faithful to us. No matter what season we are going through, a pleasant and enjoyable one or a challenging one, Lord, we know that you are always faithful to us. And so we give you our thanks and praise and thank you that we can reflect on your word together this morning. And so we pray now that your Holy Spirit will teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, suppose for a moment that you are a trial lawyer and uh, your assignment is to try Christians. Now, you don't put people on trial to see whether or not they are Christians because that's already been established that they are. Rather, your task is to determine if there is enough evidence uh, to determine that they are mature Christians, that they have a mature faith. If that was your assignment... What kind of evidence would you look for in their lives? I suppose you'd want to examine uh, their knowledge of the Bible because someone with a mature faith would certainly know what the Bible says and have a good understanding of what the Bible means. You would, of course, also want to consider their character. Do they demonstrate a a Christ-like character in their dealings with others and so forth? Do they show love to others? Do they demonstrate compassion to those who are in need? Do they live a godly life in terms of values and morals? Do they use the gifts that God has given them, the spiritual gifts, to help encourage others and to build up the church and bring glory to God? There are any number of things that you could examine when you were considering whether or not a person has a mature faith in Christ. Well, in our passage for today, Philippians 1, verses 12 through 26, there Paul alludes to another element of a mature Christian faith, one that may not immediately come to mind for us as we consider this topic. And Paul doesn't come right out and say in this passage that this is a mark of a mature faith. He's simply describing the circumstances that he was facing at the time. But I think we all would agree that anyone who could, could face the sort of circumstances that Paul was dealing with, and to do that with the attitude that he had to maintain that attitude, well, that certainly is someone with a mature faith, the kind of faith that we all should strive for. So let's read this passage together. And I'm just going to grab my water here, because I know I'm going to need it this morning. So it's Philippians 1, verses 12 through 26. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, 
knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given me by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Well, one of the ingredients of a mature faith in Christ relates to how we respond to circumstances. As we go through life, as we all know, we are going to encounter all kinds of different circumstances. Some of those circumstances will be good and pleasant and enjoyable. And sometimes we'll have to deal with circumstances that are quite difficult and even painful. Some of those circumstances will be the result of our own choices because when we make a choice, that leads to some consequences, some circumstances that flow from that. And so we may have to face circumstances that are the result of how much money we decide to set aside for retirement or what kind of diet we choose to eat. And then other circumstances will just be thrust upon us apart from any uh, choosing of our own such as a serious illness that just comes out of the blue, or, or uh, losing our job because the company suddenly decided to downsize. There's no way that we can predict what kind of circumstances we will be facing even tomorrow. The question is, how will we respond to such circumstances, especially when those circumstances make life difficult for us? when they involve pain or or heartache or perhaps shattered dreams? Will we be consumed by those circumstances? Will we be overwhelmed by them, defeated by them? Will we respond to those circumstances with anger or regret or self-pity or discouragement? Or will we be able to rejoice no matter what we may be facing, because we can always see the hand of God at work in our lives and through the circumstances we face. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't feel the pain of those circumstances. Of course we do. And it doesn't mean that God causes all the circumstances. But can we see God at work in all of those circumstances? if we are able to respond in that fashion, then we will be demonstrating a mature faith in Christ, one that follows the example of the Apostle Paul in this passage for today. Now, Paul and the Christians at uh, Philippi had a, a very deep and warm relationship. We heard earlier how that relationship started uh, when Olin read for us from Acts chapter 16. He went there uh, to Philippi with his colleague in ministry, Silas. And a woman by the name of Lydia was the first person there to open her heart to Christ. And because of their work in proclaiming the gospel, Paul and Silas, of course, were uh, thrown into jail. But then an earthquake occurred that night, and all of the prison doors were flung open, 
the jailer, upon seeing all the doors of the prison were open, he was about to kill himself with his sword, thinking that all the prisoners had escaped. But Paul saw him and assured him, no, all of the prisoners are still there in the jail. And that, of course, led to the opportunity for Paul to share more of the gospel of Christ with the jailer, with the result then that the jailer and his whole household became Christians, became followers of Jesus that very night. So there is a very special relationship between Paul and uh, the, the Christians at Philippi. Sometimes Paul wrote to people and he did not plant the church there. But he started this church in Philippi. So a warm relationship was there uh, between them. But now, as Paul is in Rome, as he writes this letter to the Christians at Philippi, Paul has reason to believe that the Christians in Philippi are un, unduly concerned about his welfare. And so one of the reasons that he wrote this letter was to assure them that he was doing just fine, that they did not have to worry about him. Paul knows that they have heard about his circumstances. Circumstances that would be difficult, would be painful, uh, could even lead to depression and defeat for many people. And yet, Paul was rejoicing even in the midst of these painful circumstances he was going through. And so he began our passage for today by saying, Now I want you to know that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So first we have to know, what was it that happened to Paul that helped to advance the gospel? What was this that had happened to him? And it wasn't just one particular event. It was a series of events that happened over time. Paul, as he wrote this letter to the Philippians, was a prisoner once again. We heard how he was arrested while he was in Philippi. And now, several years later, as he's writing to them, he's a prisoner once again. If we were to read in Acts chapter 21, there we would see how Paul was arrested while he was proclaiming the gospel of Christ in Jerusalem. Actually, it was good that he was arrested because he was almost killed by a mob. So being arrested actually saved him. And as a prisoner, he then was later transferred to Caesarea. And from Caesarea, he is transferred to Rome. And had, they had to travel, uh, he and those who were holding him captive, had to travel by uh, ship uh, from, uh, to get to Rome. And on their way to Rome, a bad storm happened at sea. It was so bad, their ship was being pounded by the waves. And uh, they could not eat for many days. They had to throw anything that wasn't absolutely essential. They had to throw overboard to help the, the boat stay afloat. Eventually, though, their ship was destroyed. But Paul and all who were on the boat washed ashore on the island of Malta. And then several months later, uh, he arrived in Rome. For a long time, Paul had the goal of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in Rome. And when he finally gets to Rome, he arrives in chains, condemned as a prisoner, forced to wait for several years for an uncertain decision by a pagan king as to whether or not he would be executed or allowed to live. And so for two years in Rome, Paul was under house arrest. In this case, he wasn't thrown into a jail, but he was confined just to his quarters under house arrest, chained to a guard the whole time. So for two years, he was never alone. He had no privacy. And these guards were no doubt uh, very rough and calloused men. Now, put yourself in that situation. And how would you respond to those circumstances? You've been arrested, not really for a crime, but for doing something good, for telling other people the good news of God's love for them in Jesus Christ. You've been arrested, you're chained to a guard for two years, and you're waiting for a pagan king to decide whether you will live or die. I'm guessing that rejoicing would not be at the top of the list, at least for many of us, as to how we we would respond to those uh, circumstances. And yet several times in this passage, and more times in this letter to the Philippians, Paul says that he was rejoicing. 
Of course, he wasn't rejoicing simply in what had happened to him, the fact that he was a prisoner and so forth. That surely was an enormous hardship for him to bear as it would be for any of us. Rather, he was rejoicing because he knew that things are not always as they appear. Some of you are probably familiar with the Christian apologist Ravi Zacharias. And uh, he was born and raised in India and now, of course, has a worldwide ministry. And some of you have heard him and so forth. We actually heard him when he came to speak in Malaysia. And uh, uh, once in a while, depending on what questions he may be asked, I've heard him tell uh, this story. And, uh, of course, I said he's from India and, and this story is part of... Uh, ancient eastern folklore. And it's about a farmer who had a horse. And uh, one day his horse ran away. And uh, shortly after that, his neighbor came to him and he said, boy, that's too bad about your horse. It seems like bad luck has visited you. And the farmer uh, responded, I'm just a simple farmer. What do I know about such things? A few days later, the farmer's horse returned bringing 20 wild horses with it. Well, the next day, the neighbor came back and said to the farmer, Ah, good luck has visited you. Now you have 20 new horses. Again, the farmer said, I'm just a simple farmer. What do I know about such things? Several days later, the farmer's teenage son was trying to tame one of the wild horses. And that horse... uh, kicked the son in the leg, and he broke his leg. The next day, the neighbor came back, and he said, well, it's really too bad about your son. It seems like your good luck has turned to bad luck. And the farmer said, I'm just a simple farmer. What do I know about such things? The following week, some thugs from a violent gang gang came by forcing all of the able-bodied young men to join their gang. But seeing that the farmer's son had a broken leg, they realized that having him come along would hinder rather than help them. They just moved on to the, to the next house. Well, once more, the, the neighbor stopped by afterwards and, and said to the farmer, It's wonderful. Good luck again has come your way. And again, the farmer said, I'm just a simple farmer. What do I know about such things? Well, that simple story illustrates how in one series of connected events, you can't tell if a particular event is good luck or bad luck. If it's good fortune or misfortune. If it's something you should be happy about or something you should be sad about. You can't tell And that's often the way it is in life, isn't it? If we look at our circumstances and the events that we face only at the surface level, how they appear to us, well, they may appear in that moment to be either good or bad, but we don't really know in the long run how they're going to turn out. Sometimes something that appears to be good actually turns out to be bad. Such as sometimes when we read in the news of someone who uh, several years before perhaps won the lottery only to later discover that life was really much better for them before they came into this large sum of money. And on the other hand, there's a, sometimes something happens that looks bad, even so bad, but actually turns out to be good. A few years ago, our our daughter suffered a broken engagement. And that was very painful for her as well as for us. And it took months to get over that. But sometime afterwards then, when she was pretty much healed of that, she met another young man who turned out to be a, a, a much better match for her and uh, a much better husband for her. And they're happily married now. 
we don't always know how something is going to turn out in the long run. We don't know ultimately if this thing that has happened, if the circumstance we are facing, if they are going to be good or bad, if we're looking only at the surface level or we're looking only at how it's affecting me right now. The example that Paul sets for us in this account is to look at our circumstances at a deeper level. And that is to try to see them within the context of the purposes of God. Because God's will for our lives is always good. And God brings about his good will through all kinds of circumstances. And while our circumstances may change, sometimes unpredictably or drastically, God does not change. God is always good. His purposes are always good. As we sang a moment ago, He is always faithful. As Romans 8.28 reminds us, in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Now, it didn't say there that all things are good. Not all things are good. But that in all things, God works for good. And so this assures us that no experience in our lives is wasted. God is not limited as to how he can work his good will into our lives. He's not limited to just good circumstances to bring about his good will in our lives. No, so all, all experiences we face, even those that are, are painful and discouraging, God works through those as well. Nothing is wasted with God. No experience we go through. God is never sort of sitting back and, and thinking, well, you know, as soon as you get through this experience, then I can begin to do something good in you. No, he is always at work through everything that we face. God is good. That's his character. So he is always working for good. Another man found himself in prison for the cause of Christ. This one much more recently, just a few years ago. His name is Kenneth Bay. He's a Korean-American And in 2012, uh, he led a group of Christians to North Korea. Now, obviously, they couldn't do ministry there in North Korea. That would not be tolerated. But they went there just to learn what they could of North Korea and the needs of the people there. And his goal was to try to encourage other people then, not in North Korea, but in the West and so forth, to pray for the people of North Korea. On his computer, there were several email messages that referenced this desire of his just to learn more of the situation so that he could help people pray for the people of North Korea. Well, at one point, his computer was confiscated and scanned, and those messages were discovered. The result was that he was arrested, and although all that he wanted to do was to have people pray for the North Korean people, he was charged with trying to overthrow the North Korean government and sentenced to 15 years of hard labor. Well, fortunately, he was released after two years, but those were two difficult years, and during that time, his health deteriorated and he lost more than 50 pounds. While he was in prison... One of the North Korean guards, and since he was a Korean-American, he spoke Korean, of course, and, and so one of the North Korean guards asked him, if your God is so good, why are you in prison? That's a logical question, isn't it? And my guess is we've all asked a similar question ourselves. God, I, I know that you're good, but why am I going through this then, if you are good? And Bay's response was, If God were not good, I would not be here to tell you about him. And that's true, isn't it? I mean, no one is going to suffer. No one is going to bear hardship to tell other people about a God that they do not believe is good. Why would we want somebody to know about a God if we didn't think that God was good? We wouldn't cross the street to tell our neighbor about God if we didn't think God is good. But God is good. 
And he even brings good about from the painful situations of our lives. Even for Kenneth Bay, who after he was released and spent some time in recovery and so forth, um, his experience led to a much larger platform for him to tell other people about the needs in North Korea and encourage really millions more to pray than he ever would have been able to if he was, wasn't was arrested. He was able to write a book. No one would have been interested in reading a book by him prior to his experience. So he was able to write a book, and he said his purpose in writing that book was simply to remind people that God is always faithful. And who knows what seeds he was able to plant, even there in prison, such as with that guard what impact those words may be had on him. If God were not good, I wouldn't be here to tell you about him. Or to some other uh, guards that he certainly had interactions with. So we must always remember that beneath the circumstances of our lives, God is at work to bring about his greater purpose. That doesn't mean those uh, circumstances will not be hard. Sometimes they're really hard and really painful, and they really test us. But we can have the confidence that God is good. And was holding on to this conviction that enabled Paul to maintain the attitude that he did. Paul was assured that what had happened to him, as he wrote in verse 12, was actually helping to advance the gospel of Christ. That is the good that was happening to Paul through his circumstances. The good was that the gospel was being advanced. And that phrase was helping to advance the gospel. What has happened to me is helping to advance the gospel. That that phrase is actually quite picturesque in the original language because it conveys the, the idea of an advanced team cutting away the trees and the shrubs so an army of soldiers could follow behind uh, unhindered by the obstacles. The army could match freely and quickly because all that would have impeded them had been cleared away by the advance team. They could march into areas they would not have been able to if it were not for the advance team removing all that otherwise would have obstructed their path. And so that's how Paul viewed his circumstances as being a prisoner. What had happened to him, being arrested, being chained to a guard and so forth, did not hinder or frustrate the advance of the gospel, as one maybe would have expected. I mean, after all, Paul was unsurpassed as a missionary and as a church planter. So what's going to happen now that he's been arrested? But as it turned out, his circumstances of being a prisoner chained to a guard actually cleared the way for the gospel to progress in greater ways. And Paul mentioned several ways in which this greater purpose of God was unfolding because of his circumstances, how the gospel was advancing. And so the first way in verse 13, he said, as a result of my circumstances... It has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm a prisoner. No, that's not what he said. It has become clear to all of them that I am in chains for Christ. The palace guard consisted of the personal bodyguards of the emperor. I mentioned that uh, Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and had been transferred to Caesarea. And when he was in Caesarea, as a Roman citizen, Paul requested that he be able to plead his case to the emperor, before the emperor. That's something he could do as a Roman citizen. Legally, then, that made him the emperor's prisoner. And so the emperor's own bodyguards were responsible for watching Paul. And not only did they have to watch him, but as I said, one of them was always chained to Paul. Every four hours, there'd be a shift change, and so there'd be a new guard who would find himself next to Paul. And so Paul had the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ with guard after guard after guard. Due to his chains, Paul had a captive audience. I mean, how ironic. Paul was the captive, but he had a captive audience. And again, these were the guards of the imperial palace. 
So what Paul shared with them was certainly then talked about in the highest of places. In fact, when Paul closes this letter to the Philippians, in chapter 4, verse 22, um, Paul said to the Philippians that all of God's people in Rome send you their greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Did you ever notice that phrase before? especially those who belong to Caesar's household. And Caesar's household would have included his family, his servants, his bodyguards, those who served in his government. Thus, Paul's circumstances helped to propel the gospel to higher levels of Roman society than ever would have been possible before. What appeared to be a crushing blow to the Christian movement, the arrest of Paul, actually turned out to breathe new life and new power into into its advance. For while Paul was in chains, the gospel was not. The gospel was being proclaimed. And then the second way that the cause of the gospel was able to move forward was that Paul's circumstances and the example he set in remaining faithful in the midst of those circumstances that actually inspired others to preach the gospel with greater boldness. So Paul wrote in verse 14, because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. The Christians in Rome saw how Paul remained faithful even while a prisoner possibly facing a death sentence. And so they were inspired by Paul's example, and that meant instead of just one free person, Paul, being able to uh, share the gospel, now there were many people, with Paul as a prisoner, now many people were courageously sharing the word of God. So again, Paul's circumstances cleared the way, enabling many others to move out in faith and boldness in the cause of Christ so that the gospel could advance. Now, as Paul said, not all of these brothers were proclaiming Christ with the right motives. Some, he said, did it out of rivalry, out of envy, thinking that they could cause trouble for Paul while he was in chains. For some of the people at that time were were envious of Paul and his accomplishments. And so they were thinking, well, now with Paul in prison, this is our chance. This is our opportunity, not simply to proclaim the gospel, but to make a name for ourselves. So did Paul resent these people who in their freedom were preaching Christ from less than pure motives? and who, in fact, were hoping to bring discouragement and frustration to Paul because he wasn't free to move about the city and proclaim the gospel? No, Paul didn't resent them. In fact, he rejoiced because he said, no matter the motive, Christ was being preached. Now, certainly Paul regretted their motives, but he did not reject them. He called them his brothers. Paul's joy was not determined by by how the gospel was preached, but simply by the fact that the gospel was preached. For the power of the gospel does not depend on the motives of the preacher. Now, it's best, of course, if the preacher always has good and pure motives, but the power of the gospel doesn't depend on that. The power of the gospel depends on the truth of its message. And when the gospel is preached in truth, its message will draw people to God. For Paul... Christ was the center of his life, and everything else revolved around that center. Everything else in his life derived its meaning, its sense of importance from Christ. And so as long as Christ was being exalted and his kingdom established, then Paul could and did rejoice no matter his circumstances. To know Christ in this way, to have your whole life centered around Christ, and around his good purposes for your life, all the while remembering that God is always good. That is what enables us not only to endure all circumstances, but even to find reasons to rejoice in the midst of them. We may not always rejoice in the circumstances themselves. Even as I doubt Paul rejoiced in the circumstances themselves, I mean, I doubt if during those two years, Paul woke up up every morning with the thought, 
Oh, wow. Another day being uh, chained to a guard. Isn't life good? I doubt it. But he rejoiced because in spite of his circumstances, the gospel was being preached. He rejoiced because he could see beyond his circumstances to what, was, to what God was doing through those circumstances. How we respond to the circumstances of life will be determined primarily by what's at the center of our lives. If we're living only for ourselves, for selfish goals, if everything we do, everything we decide is determined by how it will build up our prestige, how it will add to our wealth, how it will enhance our pleasure, how it will contribute to our comfort, and so on, then we're not likely to experience very much joy in our lives because there are just too many things that will happen in life that will derail those objectives. But if Christ is the center of our lives, if our main goal is that his good purposes for our lives come to pass, then we will always have reasons to rejoice. Yeah, it still may be hard. We may really struggle sometimes with the circumstances that we are facing. But if we can say with Paul, as he did in verse 21 of this chapter, which we're going to look at more in depth next week, if with him we can say, for to me to live is Christ, then joy will be our steady companion. Doesn't mean that we're immune from the pain and heartache and trials of life, as the life of Kenneth Bay illustrates, as well as Paul, of course. But a joy that is rooted in Christ and in his never-failing love for us and his, in his glorious purposes for our lives, that is a joy that can exist side by side with the pain and heartache and disappointment that we sometimes have to deal with. For we will know that God is always bringing about something good through those circumstances. It could be that through those challenging circumstances, God wants to strengthen our faith. Or God wants to help us grow in Christ-likeness. Perhaps God is going to purify our motives or develop our character. Maybe God wants to authenticate our witness or help us bring encouragement to others. Even in the painful circumstances that we face, God's purposes will be accomplished and the glory of Christ will be revealed. If Christ is truly at the center of our lives, then we will see in every circumstance an opportunity to magnify Christ, to see his name exalted, his kingdom advanced, his purposes accomplished in and through our lives. The Bible doesn't answer all of our questions about suffering and why unpleasant and even painful circumstances strike our lives. But if Jesus is at the center of our lives, if, if he is our purpose, then there will always be reasons to rejoice. And that is the gift that God gives us. Let us pray. Dear God, we praise you because you are eternally and completely good. And so your purposes for our lives are always good. God, when difficult or painful circumstances invade our lives, please help us to keep our focus on you. Help us to remember that you are always faithful and that in all things you will accomplish that which is good. Please help us to always trust you and may your joy continually fill our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.